Hello again, this is a chapter 9 video. We're going to be looking at the instance of operator, overrunning object methods, and the protected access modifier. So, regarding the instance of operator, consider a previous casting problem that we had. So, previously we said that we are going to create a static type vehicle called V, then we're going to create a static type car called C, and then we're going to make the dynamic type car for that. We're then saying, can the uh, type vehicle V equal the type uh, car C, well yes it can through inheritance, but now we're saying can the car C equal the uh, d the static type V, uh, which is vehicle, or static type of vehicle, which is V. Now we can't do that because the compiler doesn't like it because it compares static types. So the solution which we found previously was that if we use the car cast, if we, um, if we cast using the car object, then we tell the compiler, trust us, V is of type car, the V dynamic type is of type car, so that's why we can do that. However, if somehow the uh, V then at runtime, if V is somehow not a car type, then we're going to have a problem and it's going to come back with an error message. So the way we get around this is use the instance of operator. So this is used to determine the actual dynamic type at runtime, um, and it returns a boolean of true or false of whether that particular variable is of a certain type. So for example, um, we've got here at, at the bottom where we're looking at the message post and uh, post classes. So what we're going to say is if the post, so this that said post remember is the variable name, is an instance of message post which is a type, um, then we can do our casting because we'll know then that if that post is actually a message post then we can do some message post things to it as opposed to post things to it. So let's have a look at that for, with our car, car example. So again we create our vehicle which is a, a static type vehicle um, V and then we create our car C which is a static type car. If we then want to say um, C is equal to V, remember C this the static type is, is car and V the dynamic type or the static type is vehicle so normally that wouldn't work so what we'll say and if V the actual dynamics um, the dynamic type of V is a car type so if V is an instance of car then that is fine that will work and we can guarantee that that casting will work and we're not going to get any error messaging so that's how we use the instance of operator we use it to find whether certain objects certain variables are instance of specific types so let's now consider the object classes methods. Now as we've discussed previously, all objects are in, um, inherit from the object class. So one of the useful things in this instance is there's a number of methods within the object class which we can use. Uh, one of these methods is the toString method, um, and if we want to, we can override that method as to something which, which might be more useful for our particular class. So let's just have a look at the API for that. I've previously got the class here, and if we just scroll down, you can see the methods that are available. Typical methods which we use all of the time. This toString method is really, really useful. And also the equals method is also very useful, and we'll look at um, equality and reference later on in this video. Uh, the other one which we're going to talk about is the hash code, bit, which returns a hash code for a particular object, or in other words, returns a numerical or a, a number which represents a specific object. So let's have a think now about the two string method. Um, I'm going to create in our message post network application, I'm just going to create a uh, quick variable here, and I'm going to pause the video so I can create it quicker. So I've just written out this now to create a new um, type post called p uh, with the author called Jim. So now I can do the two string method, and that returns effectively the name of the type and then at a particular number in memory effectively. So that is kind of sensical, but it's a bit nonsensical if we want to have something which which shows us more information about that specific post or more information about the specific objects that we're considering. So, what we normally do is we override this toString method. Here is an example of an over 
riding of that method. So rather than returning some kind of memory uh, reference, what we're going to do is we're going to return something useful. So in this case, we're going to return um, some text which is going to contain the username and the timestamp um, and the number of likes, etc. And it's going to deal with all that nice and gracefully so that if anyone does call the toString method on that class, they're not just going to get some random looking memory location and a, and a type which doesn't make much sense, they're actually going to get the details of that post type. A uh, little advice on creating two string methods. There's a class called the String Builder class, which is very useful for creating strings, which could be very useful for creating a two string overridden method. So if you are going to make two string method, then have a go at using that particular class to do it. Uh, and that gives there the examples of the uh, two string change in one of the post uh, classes. Okay, uh, that's one of the methods provided by the object class. Another method which is provided by the object class is the dot equals method. Now the equals method will compare the object of which it's calling the method to another object. Now in order to understand the equals and the uh, double equals differences, I'm gonna have to, I want to discuss this with you in terms of their object diagrams. We have mentioned this before previously, but here is what we're talking about here. So if we create a student, a type student um, called S1, uh, and we assign that as per usual with those values, the student class, let's just assume the student class takes these three parameters in the constructor with uh, a name and a student number and then the particular mark or credits. So S1 is going to contain those exact, th th those which are shown up on the screen there, and student S2, which is a which is a completely brand new object in comparison to S1, also contains contains those details. Now, what we say in Java is S1 dot equals S2. That will return true. Now, the reason that returns true is because the strings within those two objects are the same. So, what we're looking for in equality, um, in uh, equality in that perspective, is that they're actually the uh, the attributes. Uh, and the actual object is the same is is the same in terms of the contents. What we then do in terms of reference equality is we use this double double equals. And what reference equality means is is a particular student effectively pointing to the same student types, or is is the object to pointing to the exact object type. So in this case here, what I've done is I've created a student S three, and that equals S one. So S3 equals equals S1 will return true. S1 equals equals S2 will return false because S1 equals equals 2 is not the same object. However, S1 dot equals S2 will return true. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the difference there between our dot equals method and the double equals, which is the reference equality. So what we'll often have to do then to make this equals method work correctly for us, we may need to override this equals method. So here is an example of what you might do. First of all, we'll check to see if equality is correct. So if they are actually a reference to the same object, then that is going to be true because they are they contain the same fields, so they're always going to be true. Uh, if that's if it's not the case, then obviously two created objects, but it could be the S1 and S2 case that we had before, where they're different objects, but the fields are the same. So if this is the case, then the next thing we're going to do is check to see if those two objects are of the same type. And in order to do that, we're going to use the instance of operator. There. So if it's not an instance of that operator, then we're going to return false, because if they're not actually the same type of objects, then we know that's not correct. And we need to do some other bits and pieces then in the last part there, which is actually going to do the, the comparison and to check that the, the objects are equal to each other. Here's one for our student object. So again, public boolean equals, it will return a boolean value. <coughs> we check to see we, uh, if we, we check to see if the equality is there. So if it's exactly the same object, then just return true. If if not, then we'll check to see if the objects are of the same type. If they're not of the same type, then we'll return false. At this point, we now need to do some comparisons. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create the other object, uh, which we're going to call other, um, and we're going to cast that 
as the object there. So remember, this takes a parameter of type object. So we're going to cast this and make sure that it is a student object. After we've used, done the instance of, we can assume that it is the correct object. We're now going to return a Boolean value. So if name dot equals other name, so at this point we're using the dot equals method from the string class. Here we're going to use the dot equals method from the string class again. And here we're going to use the um, reference equals uh, for this particular one. So all of these are true, then that will return true. If none of those are true, then it won't. So that is the function of how we've decided that a student object will equal another student object. Okay, hash code. So uh, in Java, one of the things which it specifies in the object API is that if you change the equals method, if you, if you override the equals method, then it's a good idea to override the hash code method. So first of all, let's um, just in, in investigate the hash code method. Let's go back to our previous consideration here. So if we do p dot hash code, we'll see that that returns a number. So what a hash code is, is a numerical representation of a particular object. So in order to make sure that the uh, dot equals, so if two objects dot equal each other, they also have to actually, the hash codes have to match as well. So for an order for that, that to be guaranteed every time, we will effectively need to change the hash code equals, or the hash code method if we're going to do the equals method. So just to specify that, if we just have a look, this here is the object class. So we'll just have a look down here and you'll see that the equals method it specifies here is generally necessary to override the hash code method and some reasons there. So if we do want to override the hash code method, um, developing specific hashes for objects uh, is outside of the scope really of, of the book and of this. If you do want some in information on that then have a look at the Effective Java book by Joshua Block. Here is a basic Override, overridden hash code method and it gives some basic ways of giving a, um, a hash code for a certain um, for a certain uh, object uh, of our student type there. So have a look at that um, but that's as far as we're going to talk about hash codes on this particular course. Finally in this video we're now going to consider the protected access uh, modifier. Now we have looked at the public and private and we've used those a lot uh, previously and we've always said that the private um, access modifier should be used in all fields uh, to, to support encapsulation. Sometimes where, because uh, the inheritance relationship um, is a bit closer so sometimes we might need to get access the subclasses of certain classes might need to get access to certain um, fields we can use the protected access modifier. Now again it's not really advised that, that you, if you can get around it using private then do use private but if you do need to, to get access to a superclass then do not use public use the protected one. So here is how it looks um, we've got some client class so this client class is just using other objects as it as it works through its application or does what it needs to do um, if the fields in some if the fields in the clients are public then some class can use those fields um, and similarly if the fields in some class are public then client can use those fields however if some class has some private fields then only some class can use them um, and if some class has got protected fields, then subclass 1 and subclass 2 can use those fields. So that's a word on the protected access modifier. That's all the access modifiers there are now. There's public, private, and protected. Um, so that's about it for the time being. I'll see you next time.